Well, thank you very much, Ben, not just for hosting this, but for allowing me to be part of it. And I'm very excited about all the papers over this two-day event. Uh, and right now, I'd like to introduce uh, two speakers, one at a time. Um, our first speaker in this panel is Marisa Nakasone, who hails not just from New York City, she told us, but from Brooklyn right now. Uh, she's a graphic designer who works uh, for college textbooks at the publishing house Norton. I'm sure many of us are familiar with that kind of work. Um, she's written for Harper's Magazine, for New York, uh, Granica Magazine. And before she became a graphic designer, she was trained as an art historian, has worked at various museums, galleries, uh, the Smart Museum of Art at the University of Chicago, and the Yale University Art Gallery. Um, and I very much look forward to uh, your paper, and I'm sure people, of uh, everybody else will too. And the floor is yours. I'll disappear behind a shut off video. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? And can you see my, um, my PDF here? Great. Okay, so hi, thank you for having me today. Um, my paper is called, oh, you can see my cursor. My paper is called An Excess of Reality, Pain, Language, and the Modern Mad Woman in Jenny Diskey's Nothing Natural. Um, so let me begin. <clears throat> a sad day for feminism reads the Washington Post headline for a review of Jenny Diskey's first novel, Nothing Natural, in 1986. The reviewer continues, I'd almost trade back Title IX and Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor if I could be sure that not one reader would come away from this book believing that women, not to mention feminists, really degrade themselves and each other the way the women of this novel do. Most critics, if not less vitriolic, were unimpressed with the novel, which they found cold, the writing, quote, uninspiring, and the protagonist, uh, quote, unlikable. Um, and as one might expect, Nothing Natural, which was published by Simon & Schuster in the United States, did not see a second printing in the U.S. So among Diskey's distinguished body of writing, Nothing Natural remains a lesser known work, and this is unsurprising. Um, readers uh, undeterred by explicit BDSM scenes will find in the novel distressing accounts of depression, self-destructive behavior and emotional suffering. Um, the plot, if you are unfamiliar, um, unfolds like this and spoiler alert, <laughs> I'm about to tell you the whole story. Um, Rachel Key is a divorced, depressive woman in her 30s who is having an affair with Joshua, a paunchy married man who may or may not be a rapist making headlines in the local news. Rachel's sadomasochistic encounters with the dominant Joshua have a narcotizing effect on her and temporarily abate her depression and isolation. Though she has, by all appearances, a full life, a loving daughter, an amicable relationship with her ex-husband, a supportive friend, and a stable job as a tutor for underserved youth, happiness still eludes her. Uh, there is a disturbing interlude involving the suicide of her troubled pupil and a brief sexual liaison with her friend Becky. And there's also um, a scene of escape from a psych ward. So Rachel, exasperated by her growing dependence on Joshua's capricious attention, hatches a plan to oust him from her life for good. She plans a rape fantasy rendezvous with Joshua and sets him up for arrest by notifying the police of a suspicious man in her neighborhood. Joshua, enthusiastically role-playing as rapist, theatrically asks Rachel what she wants, and she implores him with great vulnerability to love her. And the novel ends as the cop surveilling Rachel's apartment rushes to her rescue while Joshua role plays as a rapist. So uh, what are we to make of this? 
Um, Nothing natural is not a moral tale, um, as the Washington Post critic angrily observed. And the novel does not helpfully model the second wave feminist values of agency and liberation from male oppression. Um, Indeed, the novel's politics seem as ambivalent as its narrator, a cerebral, independent woman who knowingly acts against her own best interests. However, Nothing Natural, which was published in the mid 80s, can be understood as an expression of the shifting tides between second and third wave feminism. It is a portrait of a smart, self-aware woman, a woman who enjoys and seeks kinky pleasure, a woman who struggles to reconcile her liberated life as a financially independent single mother with her failure to just be happy. This novel is about the traumatic work of being a woman in a patriarchal society, an experience that has been pathologized as madness since the 18th century. However, the myth of woman as inherently susceptible to madness persists in Western culture because distress responses to patriarchal socialization remain misunderstood, or as in the case of the Washington Post review, mischaracterized as anti-feminist. So in this essay and this presentation today, I'd like to position Nothing Natural as a political text that challenges normative notions of liberated womanhood through the experience of its protagonist. As an intelligent, financially independent divorcee who engages in shocking self-destructive behavior, Rachel Key embodies contradiction and suffers for it. To be a feminist in the late 20th century is to occupy an agonistic ideological space characterized by feminist scholar Eve Kozofsky Sedgwick as the depressive position. Language in Nothing Natural is used strategically, though the narrator describes her thoughts and experiences with great observational detail. She is unable to identify the source of her depression, the motivating force that informs her self-destructive behavior. The paradox of Rachel's desires and actions the social space in which heteronormative femininity is inscribed, invites the reader to question what is considered natural or normal in this narrative. And it is here in which the novel's political critique is obtained. Um, Actually, before I move on, I just want to um, turn your attention to the um, slides here. This is a collection of different covers and additions for Nothing Natural. Um, Although we see at the top left, there was only one U.S. edition in 1986. Um, There were many subsequent editions um, released in different countries, as well as several editions released in the U.K. And as a graphic designer, I find the cover treatments very interesting because I think it represents the range um, in which people understood the book or misunderstood the book. Um, and I think it says a lot about the way that um, that's book publishers and editors were trying to position the book um, to its audiences at the time. Um, the one cover that I find particularly strange is the um, one at the top center, which looks like a labyrinth. Um, but moving on. Um, first, what is madness? Why is it problematized by feminism? And how is madness articulated in Nothing Natural? Um, And I would proffer that our point of entry is Rachel. Um, By writing in the mode of free and direct discourse, Jenny Diskey gives the reader access not only to Rachel's mind and observations, but also occasionally the point of view of other characters. In this way, we are privy as readers to Rachel's critical inner voice, her obsessive thoughts about Joshua, as well as the concerned observations of her daughter, her friend Becky, her therapist, and her adopted mother, Isabel. We know through Rachel's narration that she has a history of depression and a deeply ingrained sense of purposelessness of which she often despairs. It is also through these real unimagined conversations that we recognize Rachel's madness as something that manifests as repetitive, intrusive thoughts about Joshua and her inability to see or understand why she is drawn to him. So it seems we are dealing with the representation of the classical signs of madness, repetition, blindness, and cognitive dissonance. 
However, by the time of Na Nothing Natural's publication, feminist literary criticism was busy discrediting any characterization of women writers and or female protagonists as crazy. Um, oriented around the critique of institutions, feminist scholars such as Phyllis Chesler, Shoshana Feldman, Sandra Gilbert, and Susan Gabar demonstrated how psychoanalysis, medical discourse, and the male literary canon classified women as other and perpetuated the myth of women's natural mental inferiority. Chesler, in her book, Women and Madness, dismantles the notion of an inherently hysterical, quote, female psychology. She writes, quote, it is clear that for a woman to be healthy, she must adjust to and accept the behavioral norms for her sex, even though these kinds of behaviors are generally regarded as less socially desirable. The ethic of mental health is masculine in our culture. Shoshana Feldman expands on Chesler's findings in her 1975 essay, Women and Madness, The Critical Fallacy, in which she discusses the difficulty of writing as a woman um, to, get, to engage in the act of representation as a woman, which is a position that is culturally produced as other, um, an absence by existing literary theory. Uh, Gilbert and Gubar in their seminal book, The Mad Woman in the Attic, pick up the gauntlet thrown down by Feldman by tracing instances in which the absence speaks, thereby recovering a history of women's literary achievements. In their own theorization of female madness, Gilbert and Gabar examined the recurring language of disease and motifs, themes, and forms in women's writing, identifying the, quote, anxiety of authorship in relation to the all-male literary canon as a source of dissonance and the motivating force behind the radical act of writing as a woman. So uh, let's see. Actually, no, I'll stay right here on this slide. So Disky writing as a woman and speaking through a female protagonist, therefore, has much at stake politically when it comes to representing madness and nothing natural. How does Disky's rhetorical strategy address these subjectivities and articulate a political stance? We can return here to Johnson's notion of apostrophe as insanity. In Nothing Natural, madness is evinced by Rachel's tendency to address and respond to her inner, her critical inner voice, which functions as a sort of superego or stand in for public opinion. Indeed, most of the interpretation in the novel occurs between Rachel and herself. In one scene, in an attempt to think through what she, what she wants out of her relationship with Joshua and why, she addresses herself and by extension, the reader, quote, she, she, she blustered, gave the impression very effectively of being tough and independent. Did other people believe her? That was how she wanted to be, to service a need and then forget it. She had dark thoughts about biology, the amorous need of women's sexuality. How many orgasms were enough? It was one thing not wanting to cook some man's dinner, another not wanting more of the same and more, greedy bitch doomed by greed and biology, end quote. Uh, here, we not only see how Disky has thematized what Gilbert and Gabar called infection in the sentence, we also see how, Rach, how her character, Rachel, has internalized the judgment and expectations of society. Uh, we see additional instances of dissonance through Disky's use of free and direct discourse when Rachel as narrator and Disky as author converge in the act of storytelling as in this uh, instance of dialogue between Rachel and her friend, Becky, a journalist. Quote, Rachel looked at her watch as Becky replied, all right, but keep me posted. There may be an article in this for me, but don't go out of your depth. You can't live the story of O and be Rachel Key all at the same time. You'll get confused. Don't worry, auntie. It's simply a question of knowing the difference between fantasy and reality end quote. Disky has omitted the attribution of the latter quote, don't worry, auntie, to Rachel, um, thus blurring the lines between speaker, narrator, and author. So Disky's choice to represent a character, Rachel, who not only embodies contradiction as a liberated woman who self-harms, but also speaks her own antipodal tendencies um, 
has produced for us a complex representation of femininity. How can a character and a woman writer indulge in the provocative and titillating recollection of a sexual relationship marked by its reenactment of male domination and also at the same time be feminist? As the Washington Post critic lamented, nothing natural does not give us a character who represents the second wave feminist ideal of a woman liberated from patriarchy in all of its forms, including and especially sex that involves the explicit domination of women by men. So in order to understand the political stakes of Disky's narrative decisions in Nothing Natural, it's worth situating the novel in relation to feminist critiques of sexuality around the time of its publication. In 1982, a crisis in the second wave feminist movement emerged around the issue of pornography at a now infamous conference toward a politics of sexuality at Barnard, which was organized by pro-sex feminist Carol Vance. Protests and counter-protests were staged between the pro-sex feminists and queer activists who saw sex as an important and necessary expression of agency and pleasure. Um, and versus the Women Against Pornography, also known as WAP, an organization of women who holds the belief that pornography eroticizes the degradation of women, and in doing so, upholds the subjugation of women that characterizes patriarchal society. The conference became a national lightning rod when prominent anti-porn figures, Andrea Dworkin and the legal theorist Catherine McKinnon publicly condemned their pro-sex critics, calling them, quote, collaborators fronting for male supremacy. Given the heated conversations around women and the representation of sex in the 80s, Disky's decision to write a sexually explicit novel that doesn't resist or condemn titillation is a provocative one that participates in the discourse of contemporary feminist critique. Um, I'll just, I will direct your attention here to the slides. Um, quickly. Uh, so on the left, you see the program for the scholar and feminist uh, toward the politics of sexuality. Um, and on your right, you see a group of um, women against pornography organizers stationed outside of the conference hall at which the um, towards the politics of sexuality conference was held. Um, and the t-shirt that <laughs> that this girl is wearing, it's it says um, uh, for a feminist sexuality. It is spelled incorrectly, but um, by all reports, on the back of the T-shirt, and I could not find a photo of the back of the T-shirt. Um, it says um, against S and M. So there was a um, there was a very sort of provocative uh, group of of students and young activists who were speaking out against the pro-sex opinions voiced at this conference. Um, I will also just note here that it is funny to me that um, WAP, it was not originally the coinage of Cardi B, but it was originally, um, it originally stood for women against pornography. Um, but back to, back to Jenny Disky. So a key to understanding the ideological orientation of the novel is in its title, Nothing Natural, which gives us much to unpack. First, it echoes naturalness in the sense of unnatural sexual proclivities, a nod to the BDSM content therein, as well as the Western pathologization of non-procreative sexual activity. It also suggests that what is to follow will be abnormal against reason, something to be, to be received with a bit of critical remove. Um, this brings us to the epigram that opens the novel and from which the title is drawn. Uh, the epigram, a quote from Bertolt Brecht's Lehrstücke, The Exception and the Rule, offers a clue to nothing natural's ideological orientation. And it reads, let nothing be called natural in an age of bloody confusion, order disorder, planned caprice, and dehumanized humanity, lest all things be held unalterable. So the exception and the rules is a didactic play about a prosperous merchant who abuses his worker and gets away with it because of his wealth and class privilege. 
Though this narrative bears no resemblance to nothing natural, both works share an interest in the hypocrisy of social contracts and the tendency of societies to normalize antisocial behavior in the service of socially constructed institutions. This harkens back to our discussion of madness because this epigram raises the question, the same questions of authority. Who is allowed to speak, who is rendered silent, and who decides what is the norm? Speaking for myself, um, when I read Nothing Natural for the first time, the title evoked for me Aretha Franklin's You Make Me Feel Like a Natural Woman, which raised the question for me, what constitutes a natural woman or natural womanhood? Um, and Judith Butler, in her hugely influential book, Gender Trouble, um, from 1990, also considers the notion of womanhood offered by this very popular song. Um, and we probably all know the song, but in case, in case not, here are the lyrics leading up to the chorus. It goes, before the day I met you, life was so unkind, but you're the key to my peace of mind. You make me feel, you make me feel you make me feel like a natural woman. Um, if we needed more evidence of the internalized contingency in socialized femininity, here it is re reiterated in a song that remains popular to this day. Um, as Butler notes, the singer in the song only feels complete and fully female when you are around. That is to say, the state of being female is contingent on the presence of another presumably here in this song, a heterosexual man. Um, it is worth mentioning here that um, You Make Me Feel Like a Natural Woman was written for Aretha Franklin by Carol King, a white woman. Um, so there are layers of ventriloquism and doubling in the subjectivities <laughs> represented by this song, um, but that is a topic for another occasion. So returning to Jenny Disky and Nothing Natural, it is clear from from Disky's loaded decision to represent a complex female char character who knowingly enters into kinky, a kinky sexual relationship that harms her psychologically um, and from her invocation of the socially constructed nature of anything considered natural, um, suggests that she does in fact have a political message to convey. Um, she is not, Disky herself is not undecided about her views on sexuality, as some of her novel's critics have, have extrapolated from her confused protagonist. So I now turn again to Eve Kosofsky Sedgwick, who has theorized the, quote, depressive position as that of political potential, a state that necessitates the understanding that, quote, good and bad tend to be inseparable at every level. Uh, Sedgwick states in a transcribed lecture at Barnard College, my own sense is that activist politics, even more than pedagogy, takes place even at best just at this difficult nexus between the paranoid schizoid and the depressive positions. But as I understand my own political history, it has often happened that the propulsive energy of justification, of being or feeling joined with others in the right cause tends to be structured very much um, in a paranoid schizoid fashion, driven by attributed motives, fearful contempt of opponents, collective fantasies of powerlessness and or omnipotence, scapegoating, purism, and schism. Paranoid schizoid, in short, even as the motives that underlie political commitment have much more to do with the complex, mature dimension of the depressive position. So this sense of hope that obtains between seemingly irreconcilable or binary concepts has been theorized uh, by the philosopher Lauren Berlant in her concept of cruel optimism, which she has described as a condition, the condition of maintaining an attachment to a significantly problematic object um, in a way that, sus that both sustains and harms the subject. So the concept of cruel optimism um, can thus be used as a framework for sussing out inequities and biases between hegemonic forces and structurally unprivileged subjects. Um, and as it relates to nothing natural, this might refer to the optimism uh, bestowed upon those in compliance with patriarchal social practices like heteronormative sex um, against the cruelty experienced by Rachel, whose desires and will to live a healthy life are often at odds with each other. Um, so in closing, 
Um, I return to the end of the novel in which Rachel inverts the rape narrative and instead of inhabiting the role of the victim, flips the script and becomes the predator who entraps her victim by, flame, by framing him as a rapist. She thus annihilates the specter of Joshua, the man who became the reified text of her desire, her nemesis invoked by Johnsonian apost apostrophe. In other words, she dispenses with Joshua by killing his narrative and writing a new one. In this way, she manipulates the conditions of patriarchy for her own salvation. It is a necessary compromise, a political one. Um, and in keeping with Berlant's notion of cruel optimism, Rachel's escape must necessarily acknowledge certain truths about how patriarchy is enforced and operated. Um, and this is evidenced by her manipulation of the policeman, uh, her knight in, shi her in shining armor to her damsel in distress. Um, and this is all done in order to extricate herself from another more toxic form of patriarchy. Um, so as Barbara Johnson suggests in apostrophe animation and abortion, incoherent discursive positions on decidability is not an apolitical position, but rather one that brings politics into being. So thank you. Um, this is an abridged version of my paper, um, which has been shortened here for time and clarity. Uh, but if you would like to read the whole thing, um, you can reach out to me at my email or to um, Dr. Grant. Um, and I would like to also thank Dr. Grant and Gerd. This was such a pleasure. Um, here at the bottom of this slide, you can see my email. It's just my name um, at gmail.com. Thanks very much.